Let's get started installing Solaris 8 on the Sunblade 1000. Uh, since last looked at it, I put in an extra 2 gigs of memory into the Sunblade, and this has two 750 megahertz uh, UltraSpark 3 CPUs. So Solaris 8 is the choice here because I want open windows, and Solaris 8 was the last uh, release of Solaris with open windows, which is kind of sad, open windows being so much better than CDE or the Java desktop or GNOME. Um, it really holds its own uh, even today in terms of uh, desktop environments, and the tools that came with were pretty basic, but yeah, they worked. I uh, just like the look and feel. So, let's get Solaris 8 up. Early next week, I should have another bit of kit arriving uh, for the Sunblade. A Sun PCI 2 Pro. So that's a you know, three quarters of a gigahertz Celeron on a card. So essentially a complete you know, IBM compatible PC on a card. Pretty cool. So we'll see what we can do with that um, next week. And that would have been supported by 7, 8, and 9. The Sunblade 1000 here needs at least a later version of 8. So it's 8... I don't know, U6, I think, would do it um, for the Sunblade, of course, or 9 or 10. Uh, you know, 10 and 9 had some great features, and I may end up with, you know, 10 especially. Um, you know, things like D-Trace. I think D-Trace was available in 9. I don't know. Uh, it's been a long time since I've actually worked in a Solaris shop. Uh, we switched all of our, my, my current employer switched a lot of the high performance stuff from Solaris x86 to Linux in the past couple of years. Which is sad. Uh, Solaris had some some great advantages. Uh, but, you know, they got bought by Oracle. I, I predicted a lot of people would move away from from Solaris in that in that time frame. And again the classic uh, something to look for uh, details with boot params and so this has a fiber channel interface on it uh, well it has two it has fiber channel arbitrary loop drives inside but it also has an actual fiber channel external interface uh, for getting getting fancy with the storage um, so right now it, I, I managed to find a great deal on Amazon uh, $13 for a fiber channel drive so that will uh, that will provide plenty of storage for this. Um, and other hardware to put in here, I have a GigaSwift, so that's a four port gigabit network card. Um, I've got to get another gigabit switch so that I can uh, set up a separate ne network segment for NFS. Uh, so this and the Sunblade and the Microvax will have a, a separate and of course my you know, my main PC style server will have a, a separate network segment uh, for NFS so it'll be a little bit faster there um, and want to force it onto the fast interfaces so the GigaSwift here on the Sunblade and the SunSwift on the SparkStation 10 Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it in previous videos, but the Sunblade 1000 and 2000, they're really the same machine, uh, slightly more modern firmware in the 2000. They were kind of the last gasp of, of Sun's really hardcore Unix workstations. Uh, I'm going to do English here, and we'll do ASCII. So scrolled up a little bit. Font may be a little bit too large here. Uh, we'll do a VT100. Uh, they were kind of the, the last gasp of, of doing things really specialized. So, to try to get, um, let me make the font here just slightly smaller. And we'll go through this pretty quickly here. But as I was saying, the last gasp of the hardcore Unix workstation, where they were you know, built to a different standard. So this thing, you know, it's heavy. It must weigh, you know, 
30, 40 pounds. It's got a massive power supply with a big old handle in the back. Reminds me a lot of, you know, SGI gear like an Octane, which is really heavy construction, nifty brackets and spud brackets for the drive, and you have to torque down the CPU modules, um, which is very much different than their, their later machines, which adopted more of a PC-style approach. So the later one, you know, things like Ultra 45s and such. I mean, it's still great workstations. Again, you know, much faster than this. But not quite as uh, as specialized. So this and the 2000 were kind of the last. And at the same time, they had the 100 and the 150 Sunblades, which were the low-end, you know, about $1,000 things. Yeah, 223. And yeah, we'll reference a cartridge here. And I think I'm still slightly too large on the font, so I do apologize for I should have should have played with this a little bit better. There we go. Twenty four is what I want. Yes, it's part of the subnet. And we don't want IPv6. So the SGI stuff, I'd love to get some SGI stuff. So one of my jobs oh goodness, fifteen, sixteen years ago. Um had uh, had a couple of SGIs at that one. I think it was an Indigo 2 and an O2. Uh, and then a later job, I had an Octane. Uh, they were great machines. And again, had the nice Sony aperture grill displays, just like Sun workstations. This was before LCDs. And they were, uh, they were wonderful. And those, of course, were MIPS-based. I mean, I preferred Sun because the one advantage Irix had and the one advantage an SGI workstation had is if you're doing you know, multimedia, especially video, the great tools for video capture for 3D. That Sun was a little bit farther behind, although Sun did have, have options there. Um, I just never had any gear with the, you know, the 3D rendering, you know, 3D acceleration um, options. But Sun did have stuff. And I'm not paying attention. I'm talking about the uh, SGI stuff. Uh, we're in the U.S. and in Central. Time looks right. And, uh, yeah, so would like to get some SGI gear. Um, SGI is wonderful. One of those jobs was, it was kind of a post-production house, and they had these giant, you know, big iron, I think it was, you know, an Onyx or an Origin, huge machines, giant banks of discs, uh, really cool stuff. But Sun had, you know, it was a bit more solid. What Irix had was their desktop environment, which was so impressive in the day. You know, it was sort of a modified motif with some other stuff, some extra tools. Uh, I think they called it the 4D window manager, but it had nifty stuff so you could scroll and zoom in on objects and out. Really nice. And they had uh, screen capture built in, video conferencing, a lot of stuff before anyone else did. They were great, great systems. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of bastardizing this. I'm doing this install and doing all my work over serial and then over network. Uh, I really need to get a display hooked up to this thing and a keyboard. Um, and, uh, of course, it's USB keyboards here for the Sunblade 1000. And we're going to do a little bit of... Uh, get that. Uh, we're going to do the entire distribution, because we have room for it. And, uh, 286 gigs. Pretty nice. And we want to preserve. Let's do the auto layout. Put user on a separate and var on a separate uh, file system here. And we're going to want to customize this layout here a little bit. And var and uh, we'll make root node 
bit bigger. Is that a gig? Is that a gig? Make this a bit more. Make that a bit bigger. There's plenty of space on on user there. Again, I'm kind of uh, just eyeballing this and just want to give myself plenty of space on user to install some uh, some extra software if needed. Uh, and of course, splitting var out and of course a lot of stuff may end up on NFS here. And uh, we'll call that. There we go. Only 12 free megabytes, uh, not allocated. So good enough. Let's uh, proceed. Yep, we want the. Yeah, we'll do an auto reboot. And this is a nice fast disk. This is, I think, a 15,000 RPM. So, pretty, pretty big, big disk. As you see here, we're doing UFS. I'm trying to remember, was ZFS available in Solaris 8? Maybe as a patch, but I think that was a claim to fame later on, uh, things like D-Trace and ZFS. So Solaris 8, and that's another cool thing about it, is it was kind of the last of the, the classic Solaris operating systems before they had all the really innovative stuff. I think you could still do zones in Solaris 8. But again, it's been a while since I played with any Solaris stuff um, in a hardcore way. Um, I was just sitting there getting distracted, waxing poetic about uh, SGI workstations. Sun workstations, also fantastic. Um, although the longest period of time since using any workstation of the, the high-end Unix workstations were the IBM workstations, so the, the power stuff. Um, we had some demo power servers and you know, blades, I think, um, with the Power 7 uh, chips from IBM, but actually in a power workstation. It's been a long time, probably since 1997 or so, that I've used one of those. But uh, So this, this is churning along. Uh, I don't know how much, probably, you know, pause it in the middle here so we can uh, don't have to bore you with all the drudgery of copying files, but the file system creation is pretty, pretty snappy. Uh, I do need to get another fiber channel drive. i got to see if Amazon still has them at $13. Uh, and a, a spud bracket. But I am excited to get the Sun PCI uh, you know, coprocessor card in here. Uh, because what better use of your you know, $20,000, you know, or you know, tens of thousands of dollars, mega penny workstation, than to play some DOS games. That is, uh, that is kind of the uh, the pinnacle of use. Although I wonder, this may be fast enough to do some good stuff with DOSBox. Uh, I think we'll also be doing some some benchmarking and other uh, other interesting investigations here. So I'd like to benchmark this, benchmark uh, the Spark Station 10 with the dual Ross Hyper Sparks, and look at some kind of uh, real-world applications. So, obviously on the, the Spark Station 10, I.O. will be a limiting factor, as well as CPU. I mean, it'll have a pair of 125 megahertz processors, but only, you know, a small amount of cache. And it'll be interesting to see how these machines stack up. Uh, I think this machine will, you know, with its big, fast drive, may give my modern machines a uh, a run for their money in terms of uh, disk performance because uh, the drive is a bit more modern and I know the interface can support a, a pretty wide bandwidth you know probably up of course SATA 3 can support up to the, the limit of spinning disks as well uh, so see what's going on there but I'm going to uh, not have you watch a progress bar because I can't imagine anything more dull and I'll be back uh, when it's time to flip disks uh, we're back after the first boot up. It's now booting from the disk with the first set of software installed. Just entering the root password there. And 
hopefully the CD I burned will work. So. So we're continuing on with the uh, installation here. And again, this is probably just a, a brief drop in here on the video because this is yet more unexciting uh, unexciting stuff. We set up the root password. It boot. It's got to install another, you know, call it half gig of software here, mainly the uh, mainly the uh, the development tools and such is on the, the second disk here. And of course I've got to go add a hostname entry, um, you know, a record for this in my DNS server. So. That'll work. So I will uh, be back on the video here when this completes because again, another progress bar, which is not exactly riveting viewing. And I'm back. Uh, if you've been watching the clock here, I had to take my uh, dryer apart. Uh, the heating coil in my dryer has broken. So, um, you know, after a lot of screwdriver work and pulling things apart, uh, getting out the multimeter, etc., uh, and an Amazon order placed, I'm back. Sorry for the aside. We are done here with the install. So, not too much left in this video. Just want to boot the thing back up, it automatically ejected the disk, which is very nice, and we will reboot the system and see where we're at. So it's nice it's got fan control, so these big beefy fans aren't running all the time. Uh, when I'm just, uh, when the thing's just idling, which is pretty good. Uh, one thing I discovered for the Sunblade 1000, uh, is that it looks like this version of, uh, OpenBoot will support, uh, will support the 1.2 gigahertz CPUs, so that may be a, a possible upgrade in the future. Uh, not that this 750 megahertz ones are are slow. Um, they should be plenty fast. And see this pretty speedy boot up here. which is running. Uh, hopefully this is just a little slow in the first boot here. Uh, I can't believe I'm still up 621 in the morning. Uh, I've spent the last good bit of time messing around with a broken dryer. Which, nice to say, Amazon, they've got everything. Uh, was able to get uh, replacement coil and micro SD card, which you can never have enough of. Especially now with the SCSI to SD, which I gotta get another one of those at some point. So, for other stuff, I was looking, uh, let me know if you wanna see Solaris 11 on x86. Or we possibly could do it on the Spark. This may be supported by Solaris 11. Take a look at our startup messages here. Pretty exciting. Very, very exciting. Uh, let's see. Our disk. I'm always passing the uh, the dash H for human readable, so we got plenty of space available to load stuff up. I think I have found my old zip of Sun Studio 11. I'm hoping uh, Sun Studio 11 will work here on Solaris 8, um, because I really want to play around with the Sun compilers. Um, if not, then uh, GCC is always an option. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't have the third disk to do the uh, extra stuff. Yeah, I know, I know. I need to add... Um, 
Is that a user? Let's see here. Let's see if we can. Oh, oh SSH may not be running. Uh, is it Telnet? Surely Telnet wouldn't be up. That telnet is running. Well, that'll have to be fixed. Although I don't, I don't know why. I mean, it's on my private network. We could do telnet. Okay. So let's do this. Let's see about getting open windows up here. Let me kill that. We will make this a little bit bigger. Make that 1280 by 1024. Get a real screen. Doing Zephyr is a really handy, uh, handy tool here. Yeah, let's do open windows. And compared to the last uh, last time playing here with uh, the. Uh, Spark Station 10, much snappier. Bring up Mail Tool, of course. Set the registration and Mail Tool. So now a nice speedy open windows. Well, that uh, I guess about concludes it. Let me know uh, in the comments something particular you want to see about uh, Solaris 8. Uh, you know, my use for this is I'm going to be firing up compilers probably set it up as a boot server for the spark station 10 so hosting the nfs and uh, boot params and tftp uh so that i can then run uh run that in, in a, a diskless setup uh, for performance and that'll be on a separate network segment so i've got a four port uh giga swift card here obviously no gigabit ethernet on the sunblade but i have a 100 megabit so fast ethernet uh, card for that for the the separate network segment um, for NFS um, and maybe use it as a router I don't know any ideas let me know um, also gonna be doing some benchmarking across the Sun gear uh, here so Solaris on this Solaris on the spark station 10 and maybe NetBSD or OpenBSD on the microvax when I get another SCSI to SD um, that will be interesting uh, that is probably my oldest and poorest performing Unixable machine, and I'm not including that weird kind of fake Unix interface looking thing for the Commodore 128. So, um, so yeah, do some benchmarks across both the modern gear, so the i5, the i7, and the FX8350, and then the Sun gear, and maybe the Microvax running Net or OpenBSD, uh, or maybe Altrix. I don't know. Anyone have a copy of Altrix? Um, on CDable images. I wonder if SCSI to SD supports tape images. Be interesting to know. Well, thanks for watching. Um, hope you enjoyed this look at uh, Solaris 8 on a Sunblade 1000.